If you are a Christian woman who wants to live a good, godly life, well, today you are in for a treat because we are speaking with Daniel Grothy, teaching pastor at the influential New Life Church in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and author of the new book that just released, Chasing Wisdom, The Lifelong Pursuit of Living Well. In today's interview, Daniel shares a ton of super practical tips for how you can chase wisdom in your own life, as well as how you can teach your children to chase that same wisdom as well. Believe me when I tell you this is one interview you won't want to miss. All right, can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, and why this topic is so important to you? Yes, I am Daniel Grothy. I'm 37 and married to Lisa. We live in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I'm the Associate Senior Pastor at New Life Church out here. Uh, I grew up as a pastor's kid in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so my whole life has been in church. 6 a.m. on Sunday mornings, opening the doors, setting up, tearing down. We'd be in five or six services a week. And so I was just a, a son of the church and thought every little kid was doing that. Uh, my parents, they would take me into nursing homes all the time as a young kid. And we would go visit seniors, elders, people who have lived and logged miles and they've been through wars and they've seen tough economies and a Great Depression and all this. And they would teach us to ask questions. They would say, all right, we're going to go in there. You're going to see people. That's Mr. Charles over there. That's Miss Velma over there. And they have logged miles. And if you'll ask really good questions, you'll gain the wisdom. You'll learn their stories and you'll be the better for it. So for me as a young kid, my parents taught me to chase wisdom from the sages and the saints and the elders around us. And so that was kind of my upbringing. And then when I got to new life as a 22 year old, I would soon discover just how much I needed uh, to chase wisdom. That is great. Can you tell me a little bit more? You use the word chasing wisdom, and I know that is the title of your book. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean by the term chasing wisdom? What does that look like, practically speaking? I would say that a, a beautiful life never happens accidentally, uh, that you don't just stumble into a good, rich, full, meaningful life. It has to be pursued. And uh, you, we're pursuing beings. We are made to worship. We are made to to chase with all of our hearts. And this is why Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, because he knows that we're going to love something with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he wants us to love what is true and good and beautiful. And so chasing wisdom, um, I, I use that word. And, and with Thomas Nelson, my publisher, we really went back and forth on what should the title be? Should it be finding wisdom? Should, and I said, no, it's got to be chasing because you don't just accidentally stumble into it. It's something that's a pursuit. You open up the book of Proverbs and Proverbs uh, chapters one through nine is this competition between Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly. And Lady Wisdom is out at the corner of First and Main calling all of you come in here, all you simple, and you'll find a solid life. And Lady Folly's at the other, just catty corner at First and Main saying, come in here, all you simple. And uh, Proverbs tells us that those who go into her house go in little knowing it will cost them their lives. And so there is this back and forth competition for our lives. And we have to be those who, who chase and pursue life and wisdom and the things that will keep us sturdy through the years. So let me ask you, you said that we are all chasing something. If we're not chasing wisdom like we are supposed to be doing, what have you found? I mean, I know you've talked to so many people in your experiences as a pastor. Um, what have you found that most people are chasing or going after instead if they're not chasing wisdom? Yeah, I think, I think people are trying to chase significance. Uh, we're trying to chase acclaim. We're trying to chase someone uh, giving us affirmation. I mean, think about anyone who has thrown their lives away in promiscuity. Well, people aren't chasing promiscuity as much as they're chasing affirmation and, and value and love from someone. They think they're gonna find it there, but they won't find it there. And so we're always chasing, like you said, we're chasing something. Um, but there, there are ways of life that we pursue that we come to the end of it and we discover that there's nothing there, that it's gone up in smoke, that it's, it's as, as the writer of Ecclesiastes would say, it's, it's meaningless, it's vapor, it's a chasing after the wind. And so, yes, we have to decide 
which direction we're going to point our lives. Where will we focus our love? Where will we focus our attention? Where will we focus our affection? Okay, I want to ask you this though. I totally agree with what you're saying. We need to be chasing God and chasing wisdom, but we don't want to go so far as to say that significance isn't important or that it's not important to be loved and all of these needs that we are legit needs that we feel as humans. How do we find the balance between getting our real legitimate needs met without going down this other path that, like you said, is meaningless? That's beautiful. That's a great distinction that you make there. So I think you're exactly right. We do need affirmation. We do need love. I've got three children and uh, I, every night at bed I'm laying my hands on their head and I'm kissing them on the forehead and I'm praying the prayer of blessing over them and I tell them I love them and I make eye contact. That is a human need. Uh, but I, C.S. Lewis put it beautifully where he said these, these great things, when we try to turn them into God, they can't, they can't deliver for us. But when we discover that God, God's love comes through those things, not from those things, then we can actually be able to receive those things without idolizing uh, the person or the thing. So God's joy, God's affirmation, God's love comes through uh, a mother or a father or a, a friend or a spouse or someone giving you words of affirmation. But but God's love and affirmation doesn't uh, our affirmation doesn't come from those people. God speaks to us through those people, but God is always the source of anything that's going to be true and eternal and lasting. So you're exactly right. We've got to learn to do that fine dance between uh, making sure we're, we're receiving what we need, but not idolizing the one or the thing from whom we're receiving it. We got to know that behind it, if it's true, it's going to be God's love coming through. Okay, that's a great distinction. So that's really helpful. I want to go back to the topic, though, of chasing wisdom. So far, you have told us that you chased wisdom by speaking to um, elderly people when you were young, and that's great. And obviously, we can go to the Bible and get wisdom there. But I want to ask you for anybody who is wondering right now, is the Bible still relevant today? Because it was written over 2,000 years ago you know, around then a long time ago, how can it still speak in our lives today? What does it have for us? And how can we learn to read it in a way that it actually makes sense and we can apply it? I know that's a huge question, um, but anything you have to share on that? Yes, the Bible is still relevant today because God is the speaking God. And you open up to the very first page of it, Genesis chapter one, and what you see is that God flung the world into being and creation into being with a word. And God said, let there be light. And there was. And creation started spinning in order. And so God is the God who when he wants to get something done, he speaks it into existence. Jesus in John chapter 1. So Genesis 1, we have God speaking the word. John chapter 1, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the capital W, the very word of God from all eternity, comes into time. And so God, when he wants to get something done, he speaks it into existence. And he, by his spirit, he, he uh, spoke through the prophets and the apostles. He spoke through Jesus. And these words have been written down for us. And toward the end of the book, Paul says the words of God are living and active and they're sharper than a double-edged sword. And they pierce the, the dividing between soul and spirit. That these words are living and active and they challenge us and they chasten us and they encourage us. And so, yes, if God is the God who is always speaking, then we need to be the people who put ourselves in the way of his words. And these words, you know, it doesn't always feel great. I was up this morning and reading in Matthew 14, and did I have a, a Mount Sinai type experience? I, I didn't. Were my kids running around and being goofy in the background and distracting? Absolutely. But what you do is you just keep putting yourself in front of the words that have always lived, and, and these words will bring us back to life. And so you'll find comfort, you'll find instruction, you'll find wisdom, you'll find chastening, you'll find warning. And uh, what I've noticed about people who continue to put themselves in front of these words for decade after decade, they get into their latter years and they've got a deep peace, they've got uh, joy, they've got the strength of God, they know how to navigate life well because they've been people who have apprenticed themselves to the word of God. So yes, hide your face in the book.
in your book, you talk about how do we know how to become the kind of people who know how to handle whatever life throws at us. Now, at the time of this recording, there is a lot going on in the world. We are under quarantine still. There's a pandemic, all of the things. Um, so I feel like this message is so timely for everything that's happening right now. But can you speak a little bit more? Obviously, yes, we need to be reading the word. But what other advice do you have for us of how we can read the word and what else to be people who are calm and confident no matter what life throws our way. That's brilliant. Uh, in the book, I write about a good jazz musician, and I think living a life of wisdom is learning how to think on your feet. And so a, a jazz musician is someone who has memorized all the scales. They know all the notes, and they know how to play it in every key. So they've memorized all the scales forward and backward. They've gone into the practice room, and they've gotten it internalized so that they can show up in any place. You think, uh, you know, a lot of people think improvisation is just winging it. No. Improvisation is taking the years of training that you've done in the practice room and taking it out into public so that you're ready to think on your feet in any given situation, in any given key, with any different song. And so I think learning to to live a life of thinking on our feet is about, uh, again, hiding your face in the book, hiding it in your heart, letting that seep into you, and then spending time with people who are deeply wise. Uh, apprenticing yourself to people who have logged miles with God. So one of my favorite people in our church, his name is Bob Staten, and Bob is 92. Bob has, uh, he was married to his wife, Miss Larray, for 56 years before she died in 2009. Uh, Bob has, he was the youngest man in America to own a car dealership. He was 25 years old when he bought his first car dealership. He's got four kids and all kinds of grandkids and great grandkids. There's nothing that he hasn't done. And so Bob has lived. He knows how to manage money. He knows how to manage relationships. He's sharp, but he's also just godly and bright and joyful. And so I'll go take Bob out to breakfast uh, every quarter. Once a, or four times a year, we meet at Cracker Barrel and I'll ask him questions and I'll say, Bob, tell me about uh, what you did with your kids that you loved and uh, tell me about uh, this stage of life at 37. What would you tell me to be aware of and watch out for? And I'll come home and I'll read it to my wife, Lisa, and we'll talk about it. And so, yes, you hide the word in your heart, but you also find those people who have done it well. You find those people who have lived beautiful lives. You scan the horizon and you look for those people because they're, they're rare, people who are in their 80s who have, are married to the same person and they, they, they've done things with wholesomeness and joy and they've got a good reputation. So find those people who have done it and ask them really good questions. It's like priming the pump. Uh, out in the oil field, you prime the pump and all of a sudden you strike oil and it pulls it up to the surface. Good questions are like priming the pump and it'll pull their wisdom up to the surface. And so I'll ask Bob, Bob, tell me about, you've lived through multiple pandemics and you've lived through Great Depression and you've lived through this and you've lived through that. Like, how, how does it work? And if you listen real well, people will help you find the way through. So let me ask you, because I know there are so many Christian women out there, myself included, who would love to have a mentor, um, somebody who we can ask these really great questions to and just be open and honest and share, okay, this is what I'm going through right now. How do I do this well? How do we find these mentors? I imagine it's a little easier. Maybe it's easier. Maybe it's not as easy um, because you're a pastor. You're connected to so many Christians. How can just the average person who maybe goes to church but isn't in a position of leadership leadership, how can we get connected to people who could be mentors for us? Well, that's a great question. And and Bob, like I told you, you know, Bob's not a Christian leader. He's just a good Christian man and he's lived well. And so I, I think God has, I would encourage these ladies listening, that God has given you people right in your sphere of influence, but you may not recognize it. You may not think that these people qualify as someone who might be wise or a teacher or someone who's a, a sage. But um, use your imagination. Look for these people. And again, look for someone who has lived well. Like who do you, who's a mom that's got kids that are in their 30s that, and the, the kids are looking vibrant and they love the Lord. And this woman is, has just demonstrated a wholesomeness. Like that's worth taking her to coffee and asking her those questions. So find the people that God has planted around you. But the second thing I would say is read. Read, read, read. So I'm here in my library and I've got sages all over the shelves. 
people who many, maybe most of them are dead, but they've written well and they've lived well. And so you can chase that wisdom. And Eugene Peterson, the guy who was uh, my mentor for 10 years, he told me, read the dead people. And I said, Eugene, why do you say read the dead people? He said, because their, their message has stood the test of time. It's, uh, you know, if they wrote it 200 years ago and it's still, you know, provoking people, well, it's, it's not based on fad or fashion. It's just deep wisdom. And so you can read. Uh, there's all kinds of resources online, like equipping godly women here. I mean, the work you're doing, I've, I've logged on on YouTube and seen some of your interviews. You're doing great work. So if you, if you look around, God has given you plenty of resources, and now we just bring those together. So look for someone who's lived well, read the dead people, and then utilize the resources that are right here, like equipping godly women. I think that's great advice because so often, God has already given us these resources. I mean, obviously we have the Bible that many of us are not in nearly as much as we know we should be. We have the whole internet full of things. Um, but I want to go back to specifically talking about a real life in-person mentor because I love reading. I love listening to podcasts, all of the things, but there's just something extra special about having that person who can look into your life specifically and call you out and say, hey, you're doing this thing and you need to stop it. How do you approach somebody who you are thinking, okay, this person could be a good mentor for me, but everyone is so busy in general. How do you approach them to strike up that kind of relationship? Is it something formal where you go to them and say, hey, would you be my mentor? Or is it as simple as just saying, hey, I would love to get to know you more. Can we go out for coffee? I think I would start uh, with a light touch. I think it, it's always a little bit weird when someone reaches out to me and says, hey, can you be my mentor and can we meet once a week for the rest of our lives? <laughs> it's like, whoa, let, like what's your name first? And can we get a coffee? And so I like to keep the stakes relatively low in starting because we're all finding our way and we're trying to discover, we're chasing wisdom, which means it's an adventure, it's a pursuit. So um, I would start with a simple meal, uh, coffee, uh, and then come ready with questions and just say, hey, I've observed a wholesomeness in your life and I, I see that you've lived uh, well before the Lord and, and I hope to be able to say the same thing. So I wanted to ask you a few questions today. So no one's going to leave that meeting feeling like the stakes are too high and there's too much pressure. That's just, you encouraged them and you got better after that meeting. So I would start there. But but with Eugene Peterson, with me, what I did, I didn't know who he was or where he lived or how old he was. I just read this book of his, The Contemplative Pastor. I found it at a Goodwill on a Monday morning, bought it for 99 cents, and I just tore through the book. And I thought, I got to write this guy a letter and see if I can spend a day with him. So I wrote the letter and Eugene wrote me back. Here's the, the first envelope that I got back from him in the mail and, uh, and the first letter. And it began a 10 year friendship that became a real strength to me. And so I pursued him and I wrote him a letter, but he wrote back and he said, yes, I'd be willing to meet with you here in Montana, period, but not so fast. And then he said, I want you to write a three page paper on what is pastor and a three page paper on what is church to see if we even have enough common ground to begin a conversation. So Eugene said, sure, I'll meet with you, but it's gonna be on my terms and I'm gonna make you work for it. And so what that did was it called me up, it challenged me, it made me rise up to be better. And so I read 30 books in that time and, and I wrote these letters and it began a, a 10 year relationship of visiting him 10, 10 times. But one of the things I say in the book is to nurture a holy presumption. You're asking about how do we pursue these these people in our lives. I tell a story in here of a young 12 year old Steve Jobs. I'm talking to you from a computer that Steve Jobs brought into the world. I mean, he's just a genius. And uh, he was 12 years old living in Palo Alto, California, and he heard about a man that lived across town and the man was named Bill Hewlett of Hewlett Packard. And he was the president, the CEO of one of the largest companies on the planet. And 12 year old Steve Jobs gets out the phone book and he flips through it and he finds Mr. Hewlett's name and number in the phone book. So he calls him up and Bill Hewlett picks up the phone and Steve says, hi, my name's Steve Jobs. I'm 12 years old. I live across town and I saw your name here in the phone book and I want to learn how to build a frequency counter. And I, I was wondering if you would give me some parts to do that. And Bill goes, man, 
this kid's salty. This kid's aggressive. I love it. He said, I'm going to hire you this summer. And that began Steve Jobs getting swept up into that world of tech that changed his life. Well, it was because he was gutsy enough to ask for help. And so if you're up against the wall or if you have a desire or you, you, you hope for something in the future, don't be passive. Get on your front feet, pick up the phone, write a letter, call, reach out and ask for help and see what it will turn into. So there's one thing I want to point out from this conversation. You have mentioned Eugene Peterson's name a couple of times as your mentor and that you bought his book for 99 cents at a like Goodwill kind of store. There is something else about Eugene Peterson, though. Didn't he write another book? Yeah, he's written 35 books. He translated the Message Bible, which he sold 20 million copies of. That's kind of what put him on the map when he was 65 years old. But he's written, I've got a shelf full of books over here. Uh, that Eugene has written through the years. Yeah, I have the Message Bible as well. I was going to grab it. I left it upstairs, so it's not within arm's length right now. But I just wanted to point out how you said that you had reached out to him, not because he wrote the message or not because he was the super famous influential person, but you found his book for 99 cents. Um, and so I feel like so many Christian women are like, oh, well, I need to go talk to that Christian celebrity or that influencer or that person who is, you know, kind of Christian famous when there's so many people around us who have so much wisdom, but nobody's reaching out to them because nobody knows to. Yes. The, one of the guys in my church who is deeply wise, who I draw from all the time, he's been a mechanic for 50 years. Like, like his hands are just callous and always got oil up underneath his fingernails and he wears his coveralls and he's just a good hard working brother and he's learned he's learned by trial and error he's run his own business he's learned how to be good with people he's a, a, just a master at his craft and i don't just want to talk to famous people i don't even primarily want to talk to famous people and actually i reached out to eugene because he was he his, he had a name but he didn't like having some sort of a, a, a name. He, he ran from it. He, he avoided the celebrity. He turned down Bono for year after year. The greatest rock star in the world said, hey, can, can we come see you? Can you come out on tour with us? And Eugene said no. And so I, I thought, if someone like that will run from the spotlight, you can trust him. And so, it, yes, it does not need to be someone who's Christian famous. I love that phrase you just used. I'm going to borrow that and, and say, Brittany taught me that. Um, Feel free. Look, look for people who are wholesome, who are faithful. Like we value flashy, but the kingdom of God teaches us to look for faithfulness and to have roots that go down deep. And so the people that you and I want to be like are those people who, in Eugene's words, have learned to live a long obedience in the same direction, not people who are flashy. I think that brings up another really good point too, because I feel like so many Christian women feel like they can't be a mentor to somebody else because they don't have that flashy influence. Like people listening right now who are saying, I'm not a pastor. I don't own a website. I don't have a YouTube channel. How could I be of any value to anybody else? What do I have to offer? But what I'm really hearing from you is that you're not looking for people with credentials. You're looking for people who genuinely live a life of wisdom. So if there's anybody who's listening right now who really does have that wisdom to share, that maybe it's a mom who has kids or who are a little bit older or somebody who's been married for a really long time. Even if you don't have those flashy titles that might be impressive to some other people, you still have so much that you can share with other women who are coming up along, along behind you. Um, but they may not know about it if you don't step up to offer that as well. So I just wanted to bring up that part as well of being a mentor to people coming up behind you. Brilliant. I agree. One of the wisest people I know is my wife. She's 38 year old mom of three. She's a real estate broker and young, young gals that have just gotten married in the church will call her and say, Hey, can I, can I come over to your house and just talk with you? She puts on a cup of, or a pot of coffee, just opens up the house and they sit on the couch and they talk for an hour and a half, two hours. And those girls go out strengthened and revitalized. And they've spent time with someone who's a little bit further ahead of them and can teach them. So all of us are a little bit further ahead of somebody else. And we just have to make our lives available. We have to tell our stories. We don't have to be perfect. God is not looking for people who've done everything right. God is looking for people who are humble and who are willing and who are available. And so, yes, make yourself available. God has something that he wants to teach someone else through your life. I want to ask you specifically about how we can 
probably mentor isn't the right word in this, but how we can help others in terms of our children. You mentioned at the beginning that you um, are a pastor's kid and that your parents took you to talk to a lot of older people to gain their wisdom. I'm a preacher's granddaughter, um, so we both kind of have that in common. But for anybody who is listening who is saying, okay, I want to also help my children to gain wisdom. I want to be a good godly mom for them. I want to set a good example. Do you have any advice specifically for parents, for moms, of how we can kind of impart this knowledge and desire for wisdom to our children as we're raising them? Yes, uh, yes. And, and really, this is the most important work that we will do. It, it, it is the most sacred calling. Uh, I'm a pastor and I, and I see that as a sacred calling and I want to do that faithfully, but nothing will be more important than sending out the three greatest gifts that God has given Lisa and me into the world. And so our greatest job is our smallest concentric circle of influence, which is Lillian and Wilson and Wakely Grothy, our little kids, 12, 10, and 8. So uh, realizing that the stakes are high, read. we got to read to them. we got to talk to them about life. We've got to introduce them to a spiritual family that's around them. One of the things that my parents did for me that was one of the greatest gifts they gave me was giving me 25 aunties and uncles in the faith. Through our local church, I had people who came around me and encouraged me and challenged me. When I got into my teenage years, they had the authority to rebuke me. They had the authority to call me onto the carpet and say, hey, I, I see you doing that. You're better than that. Come on, rise up. And I still, to this day, I'm 37. This is, you know, 25 years after my parents gave me their friends, I'm still calling these people and chasing their wisdom and asking them about big life decisions and big financial decisions. So one of the greatest things we can do as parents is give great our, our great friends to our children. So surround them with a godly uh, group of influencers and, and teach them to watch the world. Teach them to be curious. Teach them to ask really good questions and to pay attention and to, to nurture their imaginations. If we can nurture their imaginations, then the Spirit of God will use that for the rest of their lives. So help them to be in a holy way, be really curious and ask good questions. I love how you mentioned being really curious too, because I know a lot of Christian parents, there's a temptation out there to really put our kids in a bubble and to just say, oh, well, if we just keep them over here and only let them see good things and kind of shelter them from all the bad things, then maybe like they'll turn out okay, hopefully. But I think there's also really something to say for being that voice of reason and helping them to interpret things and having friends around you that they can draw on to help them interpret things so that once they grow out and they're grown-ups, they're not like, oh no, here's all this stuff I don't know how to deal with, but they've already talked to you about it. They have other people that they can talk to and you've already had a chance to impart all of this wisdom of, okay, here's what's going on. Here's what you're going to see, but then here is some really good godly advice in advance for how you would deal with these things with when and if they come up. Our job is to teach them how to navigate the crazy world we live in, not to not to hide them away in a bubble and act like we don't live in a crazy world, but to take them in into safe territory. I'm not saying be foolish and send them out too soon, but help introduce them to while they're living under the care of your love and under the shadow of your roof, help introduce them to the wildness of the world and talk about it. Sit at the dinner table. I mean, this is Deuteronomy chapter 6, the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And these commandments that I give you today, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door doorposts of your houses and on your gates. Like, our job as parents is to introduce them to the, to the big world that God has created and, and help them understand what evil is and help them understand what humility is. Talk to them about the newspaper headlines, but do it in a way that's going to nurture and, and shepherd them into wholesomeness. So I, you're exactly right. And I took my daughter last year overseas for the first time and our, Lisa and I have decided that before our kids turn 13, we're going to take them overseas. Why? Because there's certain conversations you can't have when you're living in a suburban neighborhood. You got to get out. You got to see different 
see different places, hear different languages, eat different food, talk about different economies. This is different money than we have in the United States. And what it does is it throws open wide the gates and it, and it helps your kids realize, oh, this is my father's world and it's really big and it's really beautiful and it's really mysterious. And so, yes, shepherd them into the conversation. I love that you just rattled off Deuteronomy, you know, however many verses that was. That just goes to show that as parents, yes, we need to raise our children well, but it starts first with us and we need to chase wisdom ourselves and we need to have those friends for our benefit, but also for the benefit of our children and our grandchildren. Like you said, you are a pastor, I'm sure in part because your parents modeled that for you. And I know that I am a Christian in large part because my parents and my grandparents, they set that example before me of this is normal and this is what life looks like and this is what it can look like and this is what you should follow. So it's just so important for us as parents to do this for ourselves and to do it for our children. But before we end our time today, do you have any other advice that you would love to share with our listeners before we close out anything you didn't get a chance to say or any last words you want to make sure that they hear yeah i would just i would just circle back to no beautiful life happens accidentally and so you've got to ask your question you know what what do i want what am i looking for what has god called me into and and live as if there's an enemy that's out there trying to steal and kill and destroy that dream that God has for you. And so if that's true, that there's an enemy out there trying to siphon off a good life from you, tuck yourself into a community of wisdom, find a constellation of sages around you that can help point you in the right direction, live within God's church. I know the church is flawed and imperfect, absolutely welcome to life. There is no perfect church out there. There is no perfect group of people out there, but tuck yourself into the body of Christ people who are trying to chase wisdom with you. And you'll look up in a decade, you'll look up in 20 years, and you'll see that you've made it. So yes, spend the rest of your life chasing wisdom. Well, thank you so much for talking with us today. This has been just so good and so encouraging. It's been an honor, Brittany. Thanks for having me. All right. So that just about does it for today's interview. If you enjoyed this conversation and you want to hear even more from Daniel, I would highly encourage you to check out his new book, Chasing Wisdom, The Lifelong Pursuit of Living Well, available everywhere that books are sold. And of course, if you're looking for wisdom specific for Christian women who want to be all in in faith and family, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast as well. I come back regularly to share inspiring interviews and all kinds of practical tips, tricks, and encouragement to help you be all in in faith and family. And I would love to have you join us.